I am Steve Lentini, Lord and Lentini and Southwestern Consulting. And we do coaching and training. And I've been doing coaching for over 25 years. And one of the things that I've noticed about the top producers is they have habits they've formed. And a lot of them are foreign to many people. But let me give you some of the habits and a few stories. So some of the habits that I noticed is that they're students of the game. Fascinating, right? What do I mean by students of the game? They're always learning. They don't think they know it all. In fact, they never feel that way. They continue to grow and learn throughout their lives. Because each generation changes, each generation has their nuances. I mean, just listen to all the terminology there is today for baby boomers and millennials and the Gen Zers. And uh, I think I'm missing one. <laughs> Isn't there the, the Y generation? And for each of them, they all have different likes and dislikes. When I was young, there was a time, my parents thought the whole country was going to go to hell in a handbasket because we were growing long hair and listening to rock and roll. Oh my, God forbid. <laughs> and we were protesting the Vietnam War and Kent State happened. Then there was the burn the bra movement and uh, things like w uh, Woodstock. And in my hometown, there was Powder Ridge in Middlefield, Connecticut. We were overwhelmed. I was in the crowd. Uh, thousands and thousands of kids came for a very similar festival, a rock festival at Powder Ridge Ski Area, which eventually got canceled very much like Woodstock and then bands uh, volunteered to play and the kids were in the mud. We were all in the mud and the rain because it did rain as well. And food had to be brought up and it caused in a town of 1500 people at the time, it caused a mayhem of traffic. But what happens for students of the game? They learn to adapt, they're self-aware and they can adjust to who's ever in front of them. Some people call it chameleon-like, but they learn to communicate how the person in front of them prefers to be communicated with. They're not concerned about themselves. They're concerned more about others. And that's how they lead. They're givers more than takers. And givers gain. Givers start everything. Giving begins everything because it means psychologically that we think we have enough of whatever it is. Top producers don't sit home lamenting that no one calls them or that no one signs up for their work. That's victim mentality or that everybody's out to get them. <clears throat> and so when they have someone in front of them, they're looking for the traits that tell them what their preference is for communication. People have a tell. People who are very direct, if you've ever run into them in your life, they'll say things like, uh, Steve, that was a yes or a no question. They want the yes or no. And people who are self-aware will give them the answer. That was a no. Would you like to hear more? Um, meaning, would you, you're asking them, would they like to hear more about the no? Many directs would say no. Same with a yes. That's a yes. Would you like to hear more? No. They might say yes. But they don't want the whole story behind your reasoning. They got it. You gave a yes or you gave a no. The eyes... So the, I'm talking about the disc, a D and I and an S and a C. Picture a circle. On the right side of the circle are the I's and the S's. On the left are the D and the C's. So the D I just told you about. Let's go to the right and talk about the I's. They're also known as entertainers in other systems. The I's are enthusiastic. 
They've got energy and ideas. They don't always see them through. They need help. We'll talk about that later. But the C does not like their enthusiasm. So if you're communicating with a C, someone who's conscientious, they're also called detectives in other systems. They're curious, they're tire kickers. They don't wanna hear the whole story. In fact, top salespeople know that's the person you actually let them ask you questions. You say things like, thanks for the appointment. And I'm glad you found some interest in what we have to offer. You must have a lot of questions. I know you do the research. So why don't you start? Ask me the questions you have. They have a lot of questions. They don't want a spiel or a story or they don't want the details. The S is going around D, I, now the S. Again, they're on the right side. They're relationship people. The I's and the S's are relationship people. So they fear the loss of relationship. It's sometimes hard for them to hear rejection. And when they're in front of D's, they have to be wary of not talking too much. But self-aware people, wherever they are on the desk, they learn it. They recognize what other people prefer. If they meet an S, they know it right away. They talk back and forth. They might forget to do business in the appointment. I's and S's together, same thing, very similar. They'll all talk a lot. You'll know who they are by the fact that they love to share their personal details. They want to tell you about their family, their kids, how they got their job, how they got promoted in their career, what they love to do in life. The D's and the C's aren't going to spend a lot of time in that bond and rapport that everybody talks about in sales. So self-awareness means you, you learn quickly who's in front of you and you treat them the way they want to be treated. That's the platinum rule. The golden rule is treat people how you want to be treated. The platinum rule is to consider others. And leaders do that as well. Top leaders, they develop that habit. It can be a habit. Now, top producers also do something else. They learn they're in control of their mind. They don't believe what I call the acorn brain, the small-minded thinker. They don't believe their thoughts. Now, all of us believe our thoughts to some degree, but folks that have become more self-aware, they've raised their emotional quotient, their EQ. They also have a higher PQ, positive quotient. They don't spend much time in negative thinking, but how did they get there? They learned they can program their mind. Top producers understand that the subconscious resides in the cerebellum, back of the head. In the neocortex resides the negative thinker or the acorn brain, the small-minded thinker, and the positive thinker. In fact, neuro researchers have found that on the right side of the brain, the neocortex stores more of the, most of the negative experiences. In the left side of the brain, positive experiences are stored. If someone is predominantly negative and they realize it and they start to work on their brain, they understand, they come to learn that they train their brain now that way to respond to certain events and people. Neuro research says that by the time we're in our mid thirties, we've pretty much trained our subconscious. That's for people who just decide to do nothing about it. They believe their thinking. They'll even tell you, this is who I am, get over it. So the fascinating thing about that is it's not who they are. It's who they've decided to be and they no longer do any work on their brain. They just believe they're thinking. So they make judgments about others. They make judgments about themselves. If they have a lot of anxiety or sadness, depression, frustration, anger, lack of success, victim thinking, that's been trained. If you go on YouTube, Google Joe Dispenza, he talks about neuro researchers 
finding that you can retrain your mind to be more positive. They call it pruning the old, the negative, and sprouting something new. In fact, MRIs have shown in a Stanford research program that Shirzad Shamin did and is doing with negative thinkers, people that were mostly negative thinkers, predominantly negative. They took MRIs of their brain. And as they put them through a methodology of helping people develop more positive neural pathways, they found that in the brain, there were new neural pathways opened on MRIs. The images showed the left side increased neural pathways, positive thinking. Now, let me tell you how that happens. You've got things that you do naturally, but they didn't come to you naturally, like driving or getting on a skateboard the first time or skis or driving a boat the first time out of the dock or backing it in the first time. Anything you learned new, you were nervous. Eventually, though, you noticed it became automatic. In fact, I don't want to scare you if I'm on the highway, but I can tell you that I have had thoughts on the highway. Who just drove the last few miles because my mind was somewhere else, yet I maintained a safe distance between my car, the car in front of me and my car. I knew where I was. I mean, occasionally I missed an exit and said, oh, geez, that was my exit. But who drove? The subconscious takes over. It's the same with our emotional traumas. Everyone you've had an outburst up until you were 35 of anger at, everyone who irked you, every situation that made you sad or angry or frustrated, maybe you got feedback from a boss and you were disappointed and your brain said, you're not good enough. See, I told you. Now your subconscious, when, when those similar events occur, either with the same people, the same kind of events, or different people, but events that make you less than or are associated with that feeling you had when you got that negative feedback, or when an angry person showed up, your subconscious goes, we got you. We know how you respond to this. It's automatic. An automatic thought that leads to an automatic reaction is more than 95% of the time not the way to go. I hyphenate the word in my seminars and in my coaching, reacting, because it's something previously learned. You've taught yourself that. And so top salespeople and top leaders are self-aware. They know they can reprogram or remind themselves. Joe Dispenza says that. You can remind yourself. And top producers and top leaders develop that habit. They become so aware. Now, how? Well, first they begin by self-observation. George Ivanovich Gurdjieff in the early 1900s used to call that little voice, the acorn brain. It resides in the amygdala, by the way. That's why I use an acorn. He used to call it the machine. And he would ask his students and clients, will you let that machine run you or will you run it? Raina Maria Rilke in the 1800s called that voice the little hooligan. Will you let the little hooligan run you or will you run it? And what they talked about was self-observation. But I can tell you Marcus Aurelius talked about it in, in uh, 165 BC or there. So if you want it exactly, you can go to my book, Sage Advice. It's on Amazon, Wisdom for Thinking Throughout the Ages. It's been around for a long time. Lao Tzu talked about it. Again, BC. The Kabbalah talked about it 4,000 years ago. So that idea that we can run that brain is with a small percentage of the population because most people 
don't want to self-observe. They think there's energy involved in self-observing. Now, it's quite actually the opposite. You're wasting energy believing that thinking that puts you into a reactive mode or sadness or frustration or that you're less than or even more than others. That's wasted energy. If you're thinking of the past, if you're wasting your thought on desiring something that hasn't shown up yet in the future, you're wasting energy. They learn by self-observation what all their triggers are. And by just noticing, they begin to make new choices. Now, you can take that another step forward. In, for example, my program, Positive Intelligence, I'm certified for that program. It's Shirzad Shamin's work. But there's a six-week program that people can take that actually improve their positive thinking. They develop new neural pathways. And then there's a GROW program for people that are interested in that ongoing work. But it's a, it's a six-week program. And I can tell you, I got introduced to it by a grant from Shirzad. And I decided to, I noticed it did make a difference. It helped me. I haven't found the way, by the way, to live a life. If I ever tell you I found the way, run away. I wrote the book, You Might Be Full of Shit If... And the first chapter is don't ever follow anyone or anything blindly. Prove it to yourself. You begin to make your life an experiment. You're not a victim anymore of circumstance. You're a master of circumstance. But that's a choice. So top leaders and top producers in sales understand they have power. And they work to become more self-aware more positive, and more in the moment. So here's the last key for being self-aware. Just be. Don't get buffeted by what occurs on out, outer circumstances. No title after your name, no amount of degrees, no amount of accomplishments, no amount of money makes you any different as a person. It doesn't increase your value. Your value is the same now as it was when you were born. Naked little baby. (laughs) Nothing's been added to you. When you leave this world, you do not leave with anything that you did here. And by the way, on November 18th, 2002, I flatlined. I left the world, so to speak. And I was on the other side. And I can tell you, it's amazing. By the way, none of this little thinking, this little voice goes with us. It's fascinating. We become one with God, one with the universe, one with the divine, the God, the goddess, the quantum field, like Joe Dispenza says, where everything that manifests comes from. Eckhart Tolle likes to say that the consciousness, the creator, whatever one wants to call it, God, if you have a religion, that's fine faith, anything that leads you to faith in something higher and bigger, anything like that, reminds you that you are not all it. And that life itself experiences itself through us in this creation. But if you notice, this creation has a lot of contrast. If you were a fish in the sea, If you were a small fish, a bigger fish would eat you. Then you'd be part of a bigger fish. And then a bigger fish would eat that. And then an even bigger fish would eat that. And then maybe a shark and then a whale. Life is actually always feeding. It's fascinating. But here's the key to that. Whatever you feed grows. So if you feed reacting and negative responses, that's what grows. If you feed that by reprogramming your mind, reminding yourself, there is really no past or future. When you're in the past ruminating over some mistake or embarrassment or humiliation or some decision that seemed like a good idea at the time, you're, in the, you're the only one there in the past. 
No one else. The future is like the Buddha said. Suffering, desire is the root of all suffering. We create our suffering by having unrealistic desires instead of just being in the moment and embracing all that comes in life, that nothing's out of order. Christ said everything works together for good. Muhammad said, what reaches you was never meant to miss you. What misses you was never meant to reach you. Fascinating thoughts, right? To be in the moment, just be. Well, I'm here today, good. Let me enjoy this game, this play of life. That's an attitude that top producers and top leaders have. They don't get sucked into victim consciousness and beating themselves up. They have empathy for themselves and for others. They create space for forgiveness. They create space for others to make mistakes. We're all flawed human beings. If you think you're so much better, that's one of your flaws. And the habits that top producers develop include everything I've talked about, and especially self-awareness, self-observation, and programming their mind. They understand they're, they're the programmer. And it's funny that we have default printers, right? Programmers come up with a, a default printer and default apps, things that automatically run by you, you clicking on it, but they programmed it to default that once you click on it. Then there's a program running the program, right? Under this computer's program is Windows 11. And there's all kinds of apps that I have on it. But humans have a program, all kinds of things they click on, sadness, frustration, anger, I'm not good enough, I'm less than, I'm more than, I'm defined by all my achievements, all the books I've written, all the, all the letters after my name. And I'm not making study wrong or, or any certifications because I have certifications and I continue to study myself. I do it because it's my calling. I enjoy it. I love it. It's my why. And that's what top producers do in sales and leadership. They know why they're doing it. They're not doing it for a commission, for example, or leaders aren't doing it to climb up the ladder and kick others behind them down. They're doing it because they love it. It's their why. That's another trait. They do it because they know their calling. They know why they're here on this earth. I know some people who have honored their calling and have had amazing lives, but not without contrast, not without challenges. As they look back, they can see that most of the challenges and, and what they called problems in their life were actually life boosting them along the way on the path to where they were meant to be. I met a young man as a project manager who, in the middle of a coaching session at a Starbucks, I said to him, I'm not going to coach you anymore. He said, what? I said, you're, you're, there's something you're not telling me. I can sense it. And I said, well, in, we have an appointment in two weeks. If you come up with it, email me, and then we'll meet here again in two weeks. But if, if you don't, we're done. He said, stop, sit down, because I had gotten up to go. I know what it is. He said, I want to be your CEO. I said, great. That was a big vision for that young man. He had a few false starts. Things that seemed good, people had promised him they were going to, he was going to be the CEO someday of, of two other companies that he ended up working for. The third one, he wasn't even interviewing to be CEO. It was one of the partners who said, what should we call you? My client said, I don't know, what do you think? And the partner said, CEO, that's what I think. And six and a half, seven, I think it's eight years later, he's CEO. And I'm still working with the company and him. It's been 23 years. He knew that once he made that declaration and he had his eyes on the prize, but he did not become overwhelmed by the challenges 
that required some coaching. That was why I was there. I helped him look at infinite thinking, looking at it as a gift, not a negative. Because if we didn't have contrast, we wouldn't know we were alive. So he ended up, because he understood his why, he wanted to be a leader, wanted to be a CEO. He wanted to experience that because he was influenced by the CEOs he worked for. He admired them. So top producers understand their why. They're self-aware. They master their thinking. They're not run by their thinking. They understand the program running the program. They don't just automatically default to things. And then they have other productive habits, such as time management. The 80-20 rule they use. 20% of all the work we do, by the way, gives us 80% of our result. Studies have been done over and over again since Pareto discovered that principle. Many years ago, early 1900s, Pareto principle, Google it. 20% of what you do is giving you 80% of your result. So the top producers, whether in leaders, because they teach their teams to focus on the top 20%. What remains, you could even do a second 80-20 rule. So you work on the 20%. You understand that's giving you 80% of the result. So there's still 20% of the result that remains. If you take 20% of that, of the remaining, is going to give you 80% of what's remaining, you could eliminate what's left after doing a second cut and gain time because you're, you're working on things that are important. So top leaders have focus, whether in sales or in leadership. In leadership, they're teaching their people to have focus and giving them permission to let go of things that are below the 20% that give them the 80% of the result. And some say, let's do a second cut of what remains and definitely get rid of what remains after you do a second 20% of the remaining 80 gives you 80% of that result. Top producers do it. They have focus. They're self-aware. They know that giving begins everything. They understand who's in front of them and they adapt to others, how others want to be treated, the platinum rule. Communicate to others how they prefer. Give to others what they prefer. They put themselves first. Servant leadership. Southwestern Consulting, Dave Brown is one of the partners. I became certified and joined with Southwestern because I, my coaching book is filled. And so now there's 220 coaches at Southwestern. I can take people on and know they're going to get great coaching. And I stay involved. I follow through. That gave me leverage. I can add people to my book. Dave Brown wrote the book Servant Selling. I recommend you get it. It's on Amazon. If you do, review it after you read it. It's a great book. It's very much in line with my own philosophy and the philosophy I think of today, which is helping people buy. Servant Selling. Be there to serve them. And there's a way to approach people understanding you're not selling them if you have something worthwhile that will help them. You're serving them. And if you're not, if, you're, if your product, by the way, is not a fit, servant sellers tell them, I don't think this is a fit for you. Here's what I would recommend. And they guide people on the way. The other thing top producers do and top leaders is they help others. They do some mentoring. And they, they being in the moment, they look at who comes across their radar even if it's somebody on the street that needs a sandwich, because what reaches you was never meant to miss you. If you're in the moment, you'll be aware that life is a gift. Every, every part of it and every person. 
My new book is coming out this month. It's In Plain Sight. Learn to see what most people miss and embrace life it is as it is. Look for the gift. That's what top producers and top leaders do. Now, you can follow me in this series as I, I do one every month. And I'll be adding to them as, as uh, each of the months go on as, as I focus on the 20% that gives me 80% of my result. I'm grateful for you to speak, uh, taking the time to listen. If you have any questions, you can email me, steve at stevelentini.com. That's steve at steve, L-E-N, as in Nancy, T as in Tom, I-N-I, dot com, or S. Lentini at southwesternconsulting.com. Thank you, and I'm grateful you took the time to listen. Mm -hmm.